Hi, my name is Molly and I will be presenting the budget for the Board of Accountancy. Here with me today is Ms. Susan Sommers, Executive Director of the Board. Um, so the Board of Accountancy may adopt and amend rules and regulations that govern the practice of accountancy, such as the educational qualifications of licensees and the professional ethics by which accountants must abide. To ensure that CPAs in Kansas act with independence, integrity, and objectivity in their responsibilities, the board has the power to investigate whether a firm or an individual violated ethical standards and or rules and regulations imposed by either the Board of Accountancy or the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. The 2022 legislature approved a budget of $453,000 $453,894, all from the Board of Accountancy fee fund in expenditures, as well as three full-time employee positions um, for the Board of Accountancy in fiscal year 2023. On page two and three, you will see the budget highlights. Um, and the most notable thing is that the governor concurs with the agency's request for all three years. On page four, you will find... Um, a budget summary of expenditures, as well as the, um, Sorry about that. Um, so on page 572, um, you'll find an overview of the expenditures and financing by category, as well as an overview of the Board of Accountancy fee fund. The fee fund is a statutory fee fund um, and the only source of funds for the Board of Accountancy. Uh, there are the agency generates revenue from four main sources of fees, CPA certificates, permits to practice, firm registrations, and fines. On page 573, um, you will find a graph of the fee fund expenditures along with revenue since fiscal year 2020. The Board of Accountancy fee fund will likely maintain a significant ending balance in fiscal year 2023 through fiscal year 2025. From fiscal year 2020 through fiscal year 2022, the amount of revenue deposited into the fund was greater than the expenditures taken out of the fund. However, that is expected to change by fiscal year 2024, when the ending balance will potentially be less than the revenue earned for the first time since fiscal year 2020. The agency estimates that expenditures will increase in fiscal year 2023 through fiscal year 2025, while the transition between executive directors takes place. In contrast, the agency estimates that revenue will decrease um, from fiscal year 2022 through 2023 before remaining relatively steady through the end of fiscal year 2025. If you turn to page 574, you will find a detailed analysis of the budget request for fiscal year 2023. Um, the legislature approved $453,894 for the board, and the agency requests a revised estimate of the same amount, all from the Board of Accountancy Fee Fund for fiscal year 2023. There are notable adjustments, which include $252,010 for salaries and wages. This is a decrease of $12,237, or 4.6%, below the approved amount. Also included in the request is about $196,000 for contractual services. This is an increase of $10,412, or 5.6% above the approved amount, which is primarily due to a new licensure database system. Also included is approximately $5,000 in commodities for fiscal year 2023. Um, and this is for the purchase of necessary items, such as data processors, stationery, and other professional materials. The agency estimate also includes three full-time employee positions, and the governor concurs with the agency's revised estimate. If you move on to page 577, 
you will find the analysis for fiscal year 2024, where the agency requests $482,372, all from the Board of Accountancy fee fund. This is an increase of $28,478, or 6.3%, above the agency's revised estimate of $453,894 for fiscal year 2023. The expected increase in expenditures is due primarily to the hiring and subsequent training of a new executive director. The agency request includes approximately $290,000 in salaries and wages, which is an increase of $39,050 or 15.5% above the fiscal year 2023 revised estimate. This is primarily due to an expected change in agency leadership that will occur by the end of fiscal year 2024. The current executive director plans to retire, um, but prior to her retirement, she'll spend several months training the incoming executive director. Um, also included in the request is $186,287 in contractual services, which is a decrease of about $11,000 below the fiscal year 2023 revised estimate. And this decrease is due primarily to the expected completion of the transition from the current licensure database system to a new licensure database system. Also included is three full-time employee positions, and the governor concurs with the agency's request. And finally, on page 578, you will see the analysis for fiscal year 2025, where the agency requests $426,097, all from the Board of Accountancy fee fund for fiscal year 2025. This is a decrease of $56,275, or 11.7% below the requested amount um, for fiscal year 2024. Included in the request is approximately $240,000 in salaries and wages, which is a decrease of about $50,000 or 17.2% below the fiscal year 2024 requested amount. And this is primarily due to the belief that the transition of executive directors will be complete. Also included in the request is about $180,000 in contractual services for fiscal year 2025. This is a decrease of about $6,000 or 3.3% below the fiscal year 2024 request. And that's primarily due to the expected completion of the transition from the current lic licensure database system to the new licensure database system that's hosted by the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts. And once again, the agency requests three full-time employee positions, and the governor concurs with the agency's request and recommends budget of $426,097, all from the fee fund. And with that, um, I am open for questions. Committee, any questions? Representative? Thank you. Um, what are some of the contractual services? There's, some, you know, there's quite a bit of money given out to hiring other you know people um would you like me to look at a certain year or okay so contractual services um include things like communication cost printing and advertising rent um, for office space and state travel and substance um, and things of that nature. Also like computer programming services, data processors, um, really anything that the agency contracts with or has, you know, a contract with, with another agency to provide services. Any more questions? Molly did a great job. Thank you. Oh, I knew it. Representative. Um, I thought I saw the balance in the fee fund right now. What What is the balance in your fee fund? Let me find that. There's a chart with a line going through it, and I think it goes page 573. Oh, is, yes. Is that the balance in the fee fund? Yes. The yellow line represents what the ending balance um, is or was at, at the end of fiscal year 2022. Um, and what it is predicted to be um, from fiscal year 2023 through 2025. Okay. The, the 426 is a predicted balance or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there's two numbers there. One's 337, one's 426. Both seem high. Um, um 
Can you repeat the numbers or what years? On page um, 573, yes. this chart, there's one number there and one number there. Mm -hmm. the one at the bottom, one at the oh, for fiscal year 2025? Okay. Um, the yeah, green is the amount of revenue the agency expects to bring in, um, which is approximately $395,000. And the red represents um, the expenditures, which is predicted to be about $427,000, meaning their ending balance will likely be around $337,000. I'm not sure. I just wanted to know because we don't like to get those fees too high. I'll talk with the agency about it now that I know which one it is. Thank you. Any more questions for Molly? Thank you, Molly. Susan, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Susan Summers. I am the retiring executive director of the Kansas Congratulations for your retirement. Agency. Pardon? Congratulations on your pre-retirement. I'm not gone yet. I know. <laughs> I still have, a, still have a tether to the back end of me, I think. In the state house, nothing's ever gone. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some things live on forever. Um, I don't have anything to, well, actually, um, I'm happy to stand for any questions, but if you need any explanation as to who we are, we are a fee fund. So all of our money comes from the, our registrants. None of our money comes from the general fund. We do, however, give back 10% of every dollar we derive to the general fund. To answer further answer your question, contractual services include everything she indicated and also our outside legal counsel. We have a disciplinary counsel, general counsel, and our court reporter. So, And the biggest bulk of contractual services is the OITS fee, the rent fee, our lawyers. It's basically, and it travels in there, but it doesn't come anywhere close to the other expenditures that we have. You're welcome. One question I might have for you. Is, is, is the number of CPAs holding pretty steady in Kansas for people that are still in the business or is the business growing? It's an interesting question, and I, I appreciate you asking that, because there is a gene pool of baby boomers, and baby boomers typically retire at 60, 65, not in this profession. CPAs are like lawyers. They will go on forever. <laughs> but, uh, and so our average uh, CPA doesn't retire at 65. Usually it's 70, 75, whatever. So we were predicting that we were going to have that segment of people that were going to be retiring because we knew they were getting to 75. So we presumed that would happen. Um, in the meantime, we had a firm that was in Missouri. It was a quite large firm, moved to Kansas. So for the baby boomers that we lost, we got all these new people in from the firm in Missouri. To answer your, your specific question, we are seeing a decrease about 5% of the candidates, or excuse me, accounting majors. This is not unusual for professions. Anytime the economy gets to where it is right now, you see a decrease and that sort of thing. So we are experiencing that just like every other profession probably is at this point. So we are, we're about 150 lower than what we typically average at 4,000 licensees a year. This, this may be a tough one, but demographically, what do you think your average age is for your CPAs. Uh, interestingly enough, we have the same number of people in the 30 to 30, 40 age group than we do to the 65 to 75 age group. So I would say based upon that, the average is around 45 years old. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do you expect any um, changes in any of the licensure fees or anything? Okay. Chair, <clears throat> if I might, uh, Susan, can you tell me um, what your goal is for your ending balance in this fee fund? My goal has consistently been the same, and that is to stay primarily at what our uh, operating expenditures are for the fiscal year. So what we have in the fee fund is basically what we expend. There have been a few years where it's gone a little higher than that. It's the cushion. It's the, it's my mindset by honestly, uh, um, we are self-insured 
if something happened tomorrow and the agency went away, we'd have to rebuild, but we'd have to rebuild it with our own funds. So that's my philosophy that I've carried for the 27 years I've been with the board is to keep the same amount of money in our fee fund as possible to equal what our expenditures are. And I didn't realize that when I was asking, because when I saw this chart, I thought I, that looks all like a lot of money in a fee fund, but it's because that's what you expect to spend next year. And I apologize for not understanding that. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, answer, Ms. Summers. Bye. Committee, last chance. Molly, thank you very much. Um, are you going to... Um, do we have Susan Summers? What, what is your job? Well, that was Susan. Okay. So, um, do you, have, do you have any? You guys have any preference? Do you want to work this? We can work them. We may be missing some days. It still looks like it might be a good idea to work it. Yeah. Make a motion to move the budget for the. And board accountancy out as discussed for all three years. For all three years. All three years. Okay. Second. Second. Those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed. Um, okay. Looks like looks like we've passed that out. The hearing's closed on uh, board of accountancy. Next up is our favorite one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody retiring here in a, the KCC? No, just kidding. Uh, is the Kansas Corporation Commission and Luke? You're on. You're on. <laughs> Darn, I thought I missed that one. Nope, you're right on time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Luke Drury, and I am a fiscal analyst with. Um, Legislative research, and I will be going over the Kansas Corporation Commission's budget <clears throat> with you today. Um, your copies are no longer draft copies. We do have those full budget books that are out. Um, so I have uh, changed the change numbers on my draft copy. Um, but uh, if at any point um, I'm not given the correct page numbers, let me know. Uh, starting off, I would like to begin my presentation on page 519. Similar to other budgets that we've heard throughout, um, we'll have a discussion on some of the agency's um, major uh, fee funds. <clears throat> Number one is public service regulation fee fund. The public service regulation fee fund is used to finance payments for outside accounting, legal, and economic advisory services incurred in connection with the investigation of a utility or common carrier for violating, refusing, or failing to obey any lawful requirement or any order of the commission. The KCC is empowered to assess a fine against a utility or common carrier com company undergoing investigation of up to three-fifths of one percent of the gross revenue derived from the company's, company's intrastate operations in the preceding year. Continuing on onto page number 520 is an examination of revenues, expenditures, and ending balances of the public service regulation fee fund over time. The agency estimates increased expenditures from the public service regulation fee fund in 2023 and for FY 2024 in comparison to FY 2022. Notably, the 2022 legislature did approve expenditures totaling $10.2 million from the Public Service Regulation Fee Fund for FY 2023. The agency's revised estimate for 23 expenditures totals $11.6 million, which is $1.3 million or 12.9% more than the agency's previously approved budget. The increase is attributable to the agency estimating a $1.7 million um, increase in expenditures to overhaul the agency's docket system and $675,000 for consulting services in FY 2023. For that um, the docket system as well, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail into the 2023 analysis. After the public service regulation fee fund, we have the conservation fee fund. The conservation fee fund provides funding for the administration of operations and oversight of the oil and gas activities. And it is funded by assessments 
funded by assessments and fees on the petroleum industry. Again, moving over to page 521, same deal with the public service regulation fee fund we have for the conservation fee fund, showing revenues, expenditures, and any balances over time. The agency is estimating increased expenditures from the conservation fee fund in 2023 and 2024 as compared to 2022. The agency is estimating increasing expenditures from the conservation division totaling 6.8 million when compared to 2023. The increase is a result of federal action taken regarding the orphan well site plugging remediation and restoration program. I will refer to that just simply as the orphan well program moving forward. While the agency has secured federal funding of $5 million, the agency also estimates increasing expenditures from the conservation fee fund. Overall, the agency estimates increasing expenditures from the conservation fee fund by $1.3 million, which is 13.1% above the previously approved amount. Similarly to the docket overhaul, um, I'll talk in some more detail on the orphaned well program in the 2023 um, and 2024 analysis. Um, if we continue on onto page number 522, that's where we'll get into some of the more hard numbers for the 2023 analysis. Again, same structure layout as all previous other budgets. That is to say, this top table identifies legislative approves, walks through changes, numbers on the left hand side, and they do correspond with the narrative pieces below. Uh, for um, 2022, uh, there were, excuse me, the 2022, uh, excuse me again, subsequent to the 2022 session, no adjustments were made to the 20, 24.2 million, again, all from special revenue funds appropriated to the Corporation Commission. The agency has estimated a revised 2023 expenditures of 35.1 million, again, all special revenue funds, and this is an increase of 7.7 .7 million or 28.2% above the 23 approved amount. And then we'll get into the why of that. Item number two is that orphan well program. The agency is responsible for administering the orphan well program in, in the state. This is a program that was created by the federal government in November of 2021. As a part and as a part of the program, Kansas has been awarded $25 million over a three year period to plug, prioritize abandoned wells across the state. And for 23, this revised estimate is 5 million more than was previously budgeted. Again, this is re directly related to a um, federal program, and this is the first installment of what will be a three-year installment uh, for um, monies coming in for the purpose of plugging old abandoned wells. Item number three, the agency is estimating $1.7 million in expenditures, again, all from special revenue funds to overhaul the agency's docket system. The agency has indicated that the overhaul has been delayed, in part due to, to the recent COVID-19 public health emergency. Uh, the agency is also indicating that in overhauling their system, they are taking a more methodical approach to that. Uh, item number four is consulting fees. The 2020, 2021 legislature passed the Kansas Utility Financing and Securitization Act. And this allows for the securitization of utility assets to recover energy transition costs and help finance qualified extraordinary expenses during extreme weather events for electric and natural gas utilities that are subject to the KCC's jurisdiction. The act also requires that the agency determine that a securitization would provide quantifiable benefits to customers. The act also grants KCC the authority to designate a representative from KCC staff who may be advised by legal counsel and financial advisors, uh, carrying over onto page 523. To observe all facets, all the process undertaken by the public utility during the bond letting process, the agency has indicated that um, it currently does not have sufficient expertise on this particular matter and estimates additional consulting fee expenditures in order to meet those ongoing obligations. Item number five is an FTE position decrease. The agency request includes a reduction of 1.0 FTE position, and that is in the agency's utility program. All other adjustments made by the agency, item number six, total $317,663. Again, these are kind of the rats and cats items. These items cross all different types of expenditure categories, programs, 
Uh, but the big pieces of it uh, included in the other adjust, other adjustments is four hundred and twenty nine thousand and eighteen dollars for vehicle purchases. And this is partially offset by reduction in capital outlay expenditures and reduced expenditure estimates for salaries and wages when compared to 2023 budget. The governor concurs with the agency's request for FY 2023. Mr. Chairman, I can stand for questions or I can move on to FY 2024. Do you have any questions? Luke, count, continue on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on page 525, we have the FY 2024 um, analysis. The agents, again, uh, table up at the top, we start with the agency's revised estimate for 2023, identify changes that have been made in that request, um, call those out, number those, and again, those numbers in the table correspond to the numbers below in regard to the items. The agency has requested 2024 expenditures of 46, uh, 46.3 million, again, all from special revenue funds. This is an increase of 11.2 million or 32% above the revised amount and the why. Item number one, that orphaned well program, the agency's 2024 request includes an increase of 7 million, all from special revenue funds for the orphaned well program in 2024. Um, overall, the agency is estimating receiving 12 million as a result of that particular federal legislation. So if you remember in 2023, the agency is getting 5 million, the 7 million here um, is called out, uh, meaning that that's 7 million more from 2023. So overall expenditures for the orphan well program are estimated at $12 million. Item number two, other contractual services. Overall, the agency's 2024 request and contractual services is 9.9 .9 million more than the agency's 23 revised amount. Uh, 7 million of that amount, again, is from the orphan well program. The remaining increase, which is the $2.9 million, represents increases to all other contractual services. The increases in other contractual services are primarily attributable to contracts relating to the agency's new doc docket system that is being implemented in FY 2023 and FY 2024. Item number three, new docket software. The agency's FY 2024 request includes additional expenditures of $915,083 for software when compared to the 2023 revised amount. This increase, again, is attributable to new software that will be purchased and implemented by the agency um, that will be compatible with that new docket system being implemented. Item number four, all other adjustments. Again, sort of the different rats and cats out there. Three, $376,996 all from special revenue funds. And these increases are primarily attributable to employer contributions, estimates and employer contributions for group health insurance and expenditures relating to vehicle maintenance. The governor's 2024 recommendation is no changes. Um, she concurs with the agency's request for FY 2024. And then Mr. Chairman, I will note for members of the committee as well, for the remainder uh, of the budget analysis, there is an examination by programs. Uh, each one of these has expenditures, and then it also will show performance measures as well. These are performance measures that are submitted, submitted by the agency to legislative research. Um, we then publish them here for you all. And again, that is online, and you all are more than welcome to be able to find that online and, or, or here in your BA, and then uh, budget analysis. Um, and then with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to stand um, for any questions or um, as well, uh, Lynn Retz, the executive director from the Kansas Corporation Commission, is here in committee today and can offer um, some testimony and answer some questions as well. Do you have any questions for, for Luke? Good job, Luke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Luke left you all the hard work. I think a lot of them did. I'm Lynn Radz, Executive Director of Kansas Corporation Commission. First of all, I'm going to apologize. I am losing my voice, so please bear with me. Second, I apologize that I don't have everyone with me today when we shifted schedules around. I have Mike Hamia, our Transportation Division Director, with me. Um, Jeff McClanahan, our Utilities Division Director, is upstairs in front of Senate Utilities. And Ryan Hoffman, our Conservation Division Director, is at an IOGCC. 
um, meeting regarding the abandoned wall plugging um, funds from, from the feds. So um, as many of you know, we have three commissioners. They are appointed by the governor, confirmed by the Senate. They serve four-year staggered terms. And our primary divisions are transportation, conservation, and utilities. Um, with that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Committee, any questions? Representative. Hello, Representative Seiwert. <laughs> you know I got to do this. I know. <laughs> I just got to answer to my constituents, you know. Anyway, just question is, um, if I understand this right, on the, the way uh, Luke told us on uh, page 522 for the 24 budget, 23 budget, it shows an increase to 7.7 .7 million, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, on the 24 budget, I think I had it marked somewhere, it shows 11 million. That's $20 million for the two-year budget increase. And a lot of that is with the abandoned wall plugging funds that we are getting. Okay, good, because I need to talk to you about a constituent that called me about an abandoned well after this meeting. Okay. <laughs> so we have money for that now. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> and I did have Josh hand out, just so you know, because I know there were a lot of questions when Curb was before you, also about utility rates. And I had him hand out. Um, a presentation that Justin Grady did before House Energy. Um, Justin was also tied up this afternoon, but we'd be more than happy to come and answer questions regarding utility rates in more detail, but did want to put those in your hands. So one of the questions I have would be, as of now, any idea how many wells you, you've, you've worked? And, what, what, and do you have to use that? Uh, money by the end of 24? Is that just, you, but you don't get spent. Can you just carry over to you, you run out of wells? I think we've got three years. Um, so over the next two years, we anticipate 2,998 wells to be plugged. In the last three weeks, we have plugged 190. Speaking of that, what what does it cost to plug an average well, would you say? You would ask me that. Well, I'm just kind of curious because... It really depends on the district. If it's eastern Kansas or western Kansas, because it, it kind of ties to the depth of the well. South central Kansas. <sighs> let me get you a number. Well, let's, let's talk because I got another yeah, one that just me, came to mind. Yeah, let me get you because um, Ryan does have those broken out kind of by district, okay. what it costs by district. We have four conservation district offices. I see. Okay. So we do have those average costs broken out by district. Okay. So I will get you that. Yeah. Because, uh, again, I got another one that comes to mind. It, they said they couldn't, there was out of money to plug it. So I was wondering that that might be a well, – I didn't know if it was very expensive. But it depends on each one, basically. It depends on the complications, the depth of the well. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you fill us in on um, the Arctic storm on February 21? And the storm Uri? Yes, that. <laughs> and I mean, I had constituents that were in a bad way after that because of utility costs and things. And just where are we on that? Thank you. So again, I would like to have our utilities division meet with you and go through the specifics. We had open several open dockets regarding Winter Storm Uri and the utility companies and how they manage those costs that were incurred during that time period. Some of those dockets have been, orders have been entered on those, but I don't think all of them. So I don't want to give you specifics without double checking. Um, do you have like a particular utility that you're interested in on how they handled it? You have very many open FTEs? Yes. 
we're authorized for 204. We currently have filled about 161 positions. We have about we currently have 40 FTE that are retirement eligible. By the end of this fiscal year, we will have 50 retirement eligible. We've had positions posted, interviewed, offered, both for attorneys, um, special investigators for transportation, um, engineers, and been turned down because of what our salary ranges are. And we've had a lot of, especially in the, in the professional realm with our accountants and our, for our utilities division, accountants, auditors, and our attorneys have left to go to the private sector for higher salaries. And now if you, you got 161, and if you lose a third of them, right? Mm -hmm. So... How many, how many employees do you have that just work from home? Just from home? Off-site, how, how are you determine that? We currently have with all three of our primary divisions a hybrid. So they're in the office three days a week and work for remote two days a week. Most all of them? Mm-hmm. What's your average salary range that you're that you're trying to fill? Of the ones we're trying to fill, I think our average overall average salary range. I think someone had calculated it at between fifty six and sixty five thousand. Fifty six to sixty five thousand is, I think, what they calculated our average. Well, then, um, if you had, are you not able to shift the dollars around so that you can keep some of these more necessary offers, uh, make the better offers and keep them? Or We have to get authority through the Department of Administration to change the posting on our salary ranges. Is there anything this committee can do to help you with that? If you, if you had a recommendation, could we ask? Could we move on that? It would probably be helpful. Okay, we are. We don't have to work this budget today. Um, and if you have something like that to offer us, I would be interested in knowing what your needs are, because I know there, in an agency of that size, there are all kinds of ranges of jobs and all kinds of responsibilities and time commitments. But with professional requirements, uh, degrees of engineering or whatever, um, I I know the I know the competitiveness that's going on, and and um, if you had a, a a need that you could give us, we could discuss it and possibly make a recommendation for you. I don't know what that would be, but in order for you to be able to hire the most critical people. I, you know, I think this uh, budget committee can help you with that, possibly. So, just we're just talking. So, on the, the FTEs that you don't have filled, that you're that you're, that they're budgeted for, mm -hmm. there's no way you can take the dollars that are just sitting there and and work them into. That's what she said. Don't you? We have to go through Department of Administration, and then ultimately they take it to the governor for approval on what we can post our positions for and then what we can ultimately offer an individual to hire them at. And we have, we have a request pending before Department of Administration to increase our posting. So you've already developed that need. You know what you need. Yes, we have developed that need. We have made the request. Can we, as a committee, recommend that they give that utmost consideration? Is that something a letter to the governor's office or administration could, could do? Luke, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'd certainly thank you know, for a recommendation. Um, there could be some some language in there about the changing of the salary structures. I think, Mr. Chair, you'd mentioned, you know, from from one area, the you know, budgeted position, moving the dollars to a more um, in demand. That would be a possibility. Um, I, I would though also, um, uh, with Department of Administration, the executive branch dealings, I'd, I'd want to have some conversations with some other folks in our office to see, um, you know, what other sort of um, options or like you say, if it's uh, if it's just language on the subcommittee report, the budget committee report, um, I'm unsure. But let me let me ask around. Just to follow up on that. Once you open that can, everyone will want a piece of that can. Right. There's some salary discussions going on. Or Mr. Chair, I, to my knowledge, I'm not entirely sure if there is a uh, executive branch salary study. I'm, I'm unsure. I'll, I'll check onto that as well. But you could make a motion of whatever you're wanting to do. We could vote on it and then try to get the budget out today. Ever, if you want to just put a hold on it, we'll try to reschedule it. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I think since she said the recommendation is already in the administrative office, that we should just let that lie. And um, then possibly, if we have no other concerns about this budget, we could make a motion to um, ask the governor's office or administration department to to uh, give them the ability to move some money around. But I don't know exactly how that should be worded. And um, I don't know where they are on the process. I mean, I'd be happy to be supportive in that way. Um, thank you. Just for the sake of conversation, I mean, I think we're kind of hearing this with a lot of agencies, especially that hire um, those professional um, folks that, you know, require additional like engineers and attorneys and such. And so it seems like it's a bigger issue than just one agency where they need some flexibility to be able to, you know, make those offers to meet those demands. But it, it seems like this is a bigger issue than just one agency as far as like needing some kind of flexibility or some kind of incentive or bonus when we get into these crunches. Because I think some folks look at it just as they're just FTEs, but it hurts our capacity to regulate and to enforce the actual laws that we're passing. So you know, we don't want to handicap our agencies, but I think we need to understand a little bit more about, number one, what the solutions would be as far as like providing that flexibility or some kind of hiring incentives um, and looking at it in a global way. But I'm supportive of what we're talking about as far as being supportive of their request. Um, but I think we should just keep in mind that we're hearing this across agencies and we should probably try to get this to a more global discussion, I would think. Does that make sense? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> All these uh, positions, do they require special technical degrees or special engineering degrees or what makes them hard to fill? The attorney and um, geologists, engineers, yes, they require higher education. And it is just the private sector competition. They pay more. Um, that would be my next question then. So for what you're offering starting versus what private industry, I'd like to know the difference between those levels. Could you be able to, that would, might be a survey that we would need to do to see how we stack up to private industry level. It's going to vary. Would that help you then? Yeah, it's going to vary. I can tell you that the attorney, we've had two attorneys leave in the last, I think, six months. One just left a week ago for twice the amount of salary and 100% remote work. Um, another one left about six months ago, again, for about twice what we can pay and um, better better pension and and vacation benefits than what we have to offer. I, I understand there's a competition, Mark, but there comes a point in time that not all of them, but I still think it'd be interesting to see what the base is for what 
you have and what the market is, you know, because if it's $100,000 more, that's unrealistic because it's a different type of practice. But thanks for answering that. Maybe that would be something you could present to answer the questions that I hear being asked today. So I have one question from a constituent, a mic on. So, you know, when um, they, they built, uh, to establish the wind farms, and it seems like they build, they lease, the, they get the leases, build the wind farms, then they act like, oh no, now we need a transmission line. And one of my constituents um, um, well, you know, they just take it, they're just right now that's in a domain where they no, normally when they do that transmission line, unless they get a, get a bot some other way. So I was asking, or he was asking me, is there any reason why that the, when they have a wind farm proposed that they removed, would be required to have a transmission line uh, somehow without intimate domain done before they do the farm to cut down on some heartburn? Okay, a couple of things there. One, if it's a wind farm that is a being built by a non-jurisdictional entity we have no jurisdiction they can opt out that's problem number one or issue number one number two is um, when you're talking about that is it a jurisdictional entity that they were contacted by or a non-jurisdictional entity I'm, I'm not in the games what does that mean to me jurisdictional so jurisdictional would be depending the company who's building the wind farm right and so our jurisdictional utility companies are Evergy, Liberty, um, Empire. Um, those are um, our jurisdictionals. Some of these wind farms are built by non-jurisdictionals. So meaning we don't have any jurisdiction over them. Um, I'm trying to think of. So it's so just asking you, could the, the problem that I'm, putting before you, could that basically be solved legislatively? Potentially. I think I'd want to sit down with you with our utility staff and talk about some more specifics um, regarding that situation. Um, because with when it comes to eminent domain, um, my understanding is when they're building a wind farm, we send a letter to them that says if they're non-jurisdictional, we find out that you're threatening eminent domain. We're going to bring you in and take a look at it and potentially certificate you as a jurisdictional utility. So there's several things going on there that I think our utility staff should sit down and, and sort through with you. My constituent, to, for me to be smart enough to ask the questions, would be to get the name of the company that's coming through with the wind farm and the and the line. Correct. Okay. That that would be our best starting spot. So the reason for I'm also in tax and up in the northern um, counties, they did the transmission line and put them in such a high you know high tax bracket that we're trying to find a way to. Uh, you, we heard that to try to try to save them from paying all their capital gains for something they didn't want to sell in the first place. So, no, hang on, Representative. So, are you are you referring to the wind turbines or the transmission lines? What I was saying, what my suggestion was, the way it seems to work is the wind farms get going, and then they act like a surprise on the transmission line. Uh, my my thought would be they'd have to get authorization for the transmission line before you can access the wind farm. You know what I'm saying? If you don't, if, if you have to intimate domain all your property to get the transmission line in, that makes a lot of landowners pretty upset. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One concern we have in, in my part of the world state is KCC gave the Greenbelt Express or whatever you want to call it, I don't know what it's called now, eminent domain. And we fought that, and that was 10, 11 years ago, and KCC went ahead and, 
approved eminent domain for this DC transmission line, which has huge, um, huge, huge, it's huge. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and, uh, I have one constituent who's approached me and said, you know, when we, we asked them just to move it 350 feet, it's be on the same person's property. And by the way, Invernergy owns this now. It wasn't them before, but they own it now. Um, they wouldn't do it. And unfortunately, you can't do anything about this. My con our, the constituent I'm talking to signed a contract, but he was un they were under the impression that they were going to move it. I don't know how he got that, but because uh, I wasn't there when the conversation was made. But it just seems like once they get going, they're bullies. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? I did have one. Okay. Um, I've worked a lot with eminent domain, but I don't know uh, when you were t discussing this. Do you have to grant authority to a company? to use eminent domain. I know government can use it for roads and, and right of ways, but what about, I mean, is, how does it work with this? My understanding is they have to be a certificated utility in the state to, to exercise eminent domain. So that's the companies you named that your jurisdiction Those over. would be, yeah. Um, now like, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that have recently been certificated. Um, Next Terra was certificated um, for a line to go from from Wolf Creek to Black. It's called the Blackberry Line. Um, so Next Terra was certificated for that purpose. So they were requesting eminent domain for a purpose. So is that what you mean by certificated? They're certificated as a utility company in in the state of kansas so they are now one of the instead of three there's four they're okay. certificated for that yeah so you're jurisdictional over them for that particular yeah okay so there's a process that a company would have to go through with kcc before kcc could grant them the right to use eminent domain yeah so well, grain belt was was one at the time now it's in energy or yeah They've been bought out since then, but yeah. Okay, so the, I just, that was for my personal use of the tool because I, I write legislation regarding that sometimes. Thank you. Okay, Representative, you're next. Then. In regards to that same question, um, the IOUs and the co-ops have the ability to do eminent domain, right? Because they're the primary utility company in the state. Is that correct? I can't tell you definitively on the co-ops because we don't regulate them. So now I'm outside my lane there. Okay, let's just go back to the IOUs. <laughs> but the then. IOUs. Okay. And so that's why the IOUs tried to run all the transmission transmission lines for the wind farms because they're guaranteed a rate of return on their investment. Is that not correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. Now, in the case of the previous representative, where they were granted permission to work as a utility that exempted them from that law. Is that correct? They exempted them. So it did allow them to exercise yes. eminent domain. Okay. Yes. Well, how did, uh, if they're not a registered utility, because we have the same problem in Wichita, in a rural area for a wind farm, solar farm, that they're building a transmission line for it already before the farm goes in but they're using the eminent domain because Evergy is contracting for the wind farm, which seems like a conflict of interest, but might visit with you. Are you familiar with that one? The Buffalo Flats? Not, so yeah, I think it's called Buffalo Flats. Okay. It goes from Garden Plain to Colwich. And we got highly involved in that last year before I was removed as chair. <laughs> Just curious. And I will talk to Jeff and Justin about that yeah, if one. We can, and if get you back can visit with, with, you. with me, you know, yeah. Unless they want to remove me from this committee too, but <laughs> you know, but 
that's some of the questions it seems like everybody has on how that is determined and which company has that right of eminent domain. Yeah, okay. I, th I think that would be good with all the questions around eminent domain to have Jeff and Justin yeah. and put them under under. Well, uh, you know, that goes back to those, whether you got a $50,000 lawyer or $150,000 lawyer, you, exactly. get, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. <laughs> yes, exactly. Sorry, you get what you pay for here yeah. today. No, so thank you. Um, let's put Jeff and Justin at, okay. at the microphone. And um, okay. That's so not I a think big deal, but it'd be domain, just clarification yeah. for some of the committee members that maybe have wind farms going through them that they don't know the answers that when their constituents contact them because each one seems to be a different way it's handled. And, and that's what some people don't understand. Okay. I think that's a fine line if they're contracting yeah. with them who's actually putting the wind farm in and who's contracting so i want to get clarification from jeff and justin so i think we should and be the in. difference between that an example is the one that went through wichita from wsu to the transmission station that was a controversial line because of eminent domain there but that was basically rewarded as a utility line was that not correct we solved that it took us two years but Years to yeah, remember that? Line. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that was a, a different scenario because they use that right as a utility. It's, yeah, and it has okay. to do with the size of the line in that particular yes. situation. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I just sitting here thinking um, reminded me of a few years ago um, when we had an issue with the BAPS. And I don't know if that continues to be an issue, if that's something that has been solved or if we're still seeing BAPs installed in people's front yards. I have not heard of any, but again, um, I'm not in that day in and day out. So I will ask Jeff and Justin. So do they do that by eminent domain? Was, were, were those poles installed? using eminent domain or was that a different process? Do you know? I don't know. Off okay. The top of my I'm just head curious. Representative, so I will yeah. find out for you. Yes. And I, I know that um, my municipal utility is outside of your jurisdiction, but we have BAPS too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will, I will get an answer for you on that one. Thank you. Just a comment that the Grain Belt Express goes from basically Southwest Kansas up at an angle up through and comes goes out northeast Kansas across Missouri to I don't know where it stops but the whole purpose of it is to move the power from the wind turbines or solar I suppose to energy from Kansas that's developed in Kansas and made in Kansas to other places to sell and before Invernergy bought it the Grain Belt Express I don't know who owned it before that but my understanding was they were basically, they'd quit. So Invernergy came in and bought it, and now um, they were given eminent domain long before Invernergy had it. And I, I'm not an attorney, so I can't say it was right or wrong, but it just seemed like KCC ramrodded that eminent domain through at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In lieu of all the things we talked about here today, I move that we move this to Wendy continuation and have uh, Justin maybe come down and ask some of the questions and you can maybe have some of those questions if anybody has any. So that's my motion to do if that's anybody has any questions on that. We got a second. Any discussion? Vote in favor. Mr. Chair, I move my motion. Second. 